Welcome to another episode of Prostas Parquetum. It's May 2021 and my guest today is Andy Bond, who is the CEO of Pepco Group, which is running a 3000 plus chain of discount stores across Europe, including Poland, and is currently going through an uh, initial public offering in Warsaw. Andy, welcome to our show. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, to begin with, I would like to discuss some technical uh, details of your uh, offering. Pepco is selling, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Pepco is selling only existing shares amounting to about 18% of total share capital. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the actual detail will be decided this week, but yes, that's about right, somewhere between 18 and 23%. And as you say, it's existing shares. And, and the purpose for that is because the shareholder historically has been Steinhoff, who uh, have got to pay back their creditors, so it's to raise cash to pay the creditors of Steinhoff. All right, and and, and how will the um, uh, change? How will this change Pepco's structures uh, structure of ownership? I understand that uh, this is only Steinhoff uh, who is selling its stock. Members of the manage, ma managing board are not selling their own shares. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've got a small shareholding in the company. I'll be smell, selling a very small part of my shares, but yes, I'll be keeping my shares in the company. Um, and how will it change things? In reality, in terms of day-to-day -day operations, it won't change life at all. Uh, but, I mean, it, it will be the end of the journey towards separation of our business from Steinhoff. Uh, will Steinhoff remain the main uh, stakeholder in the company? Well, look, it is a complicated situation because Steinhoff technically went into bankruptcy uh, three years ago. And in doing so, the control of their shares is actually now in the hands of their creditors. So on our board, there are appointees of the creditors and they control the sale, the IPO and, and the sell down of the shares post IPO. So in effect, it's not actually Steinhoff. Who, who any longer control their own shares, it's the creditors to start with. All right, I'm asking all these questions because there are some worries among uh, potential investors uh, that the lock-up mm. period on the rest of Steinhoff uh, Pepco's holdings uh, uh, are, are set at 180 days, half, half of a year, and seem, this seems to be quite short by recent uh, standards in Poland. And um, some investors are worried that, that there will be a flood of shares hitting the market uh, uh, in a couple of months. Well, look, I, I think I'm not sure that a lockup of 180 days is that unusual. I mean, I, I would consider this very similar to private equity style sale. I mean, the other thing to bear in mind is that the creditors to, uh, to start off, as you suggest, in the long term will want to sell more shares. And so it's very much in their interest as a seller, as much as the buyers of shares, for there to be an orderly market. It's in no one's interest for there to be stagnation in the share price. So I, I think the, the sell down of the shares will be done in a very controlled way. And it's also worthwhile remembering that there's no deadline to any sale of extra shares. It can take as long or as little time as is sensible for the market and as i said the most important thing for, for everyone to think about is that it's in both the sellers and buyers interest for there to be a good aftermarket for the shares all right um this is quite convincing actually uh but it seems that the new minority shareholders they, they will have around 20 percent 24 as you said uh, at the most uh, control over the company uh, will you somehow try to encourage them to engage with the company, increase their voting power relatively to what they really hold? Well, look, what is your uh, offer I to think, minority shareholders? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think the, the, the offer or, or the suggestion is that we have constructed a board that's the highest governance standards. Uh, we will have five independent directors, all recruited and appointed by myself uh, with the interests of minority shareholders in mind. Uh, and, and they are technically obligated to represent uh, all shareholders equally. Uh, and so I, I think that we are in a, a very good place in terms of reassuring minorities that their interests will be well represented. Uh, all right. Could you please explain wh explain why did you decide, or rather, why Steinhoff decided to uh, to go public in Warsaw as opposed to London or I don't know maybe Amsterdam? 
Yeah, yeah. Again, sorry to repeat myself. I mean, Steinoff have lost their control over this process three years ago. So it's the pro we have three people on our board who represent the creditors. So my, it was the board of, of Pepco, including myself, that made this decision. And, and fundamentally, it, it, it's because if you look through the lens of the company, then we are a, a Polish first business. You know, our, our home is the Polish market. It's where we have our most stores. It's where we generate a, a significant amount of our revenues and profitability. So it was a, a very simple decision to take. It is our home. Uh, all right. Which, which European companies, uh, let's now uh, speak about your business uh, instead of the uh, aspects of the IPO. Yeah. Uh, which, which European companies do you consider to be your main uh, competitors? Um, I'm asking this because I'm wondering what, what companies investors should uh, see as your peers, as a reference group, uh, when thinking about the valuation metrics. Uh, yeah. Of your offer. Well, it's a good question, of course. Part of me wants to steer you to the businesses with the highest valuations, of course. But um, look, I, I, think there are, I think there are two ways to look at that. Which businesses have got the same business model? And if you think about businesses with the same business model, the most uh, obvious and, and admirable competitor is Action. Uh, now, Action is not a, a business that you can actually see their, their share valuation easily, but you can because it's the major constituent part of 3i, which is a listed vehicle. Uh, and then in terms of Eastern Europe, so in terms of business model, I would encourage people to look at Action. And then in terms of ge a geographical dominance, then, you know, our main market is Poland. And so I encourage people to look at discounters in Poland, people like uh, Dino, um, is a, is the obvious one. So that'd be my two main focuses: would be Action and Dino. Uh, all right. Uh, we mentioned that you're not issuing uh, any new shares uh, yet. Pepco has an ambitious growth plan with uh, over 200 new stores uh, openings uh, plan, planned yep. uh, for this year. How are you going to finance this uh, this development? Yeah, well, look, I think it's a good point. We are a very, very high growth business. Uh, in actual fact, this year for, for Pepco, we'll open over 300 shops and then we'll also oh. open nearly 100 shops with a deals brand. Um, now, we're very fortunate in our, our business is both large and, and uh, profitable. And so our free cash flow uh, allows us to expand the business without the need for external finance. In fact, we can probably... Uh, uh, fund a significantly larger growth plan than that if we wish to do so. So the, the reason we're not raising capital for growth is that simply that we don't need that those funds right now. We can fund our, our growth from our own free cash flow. Uh, you mentioned the Deals brand and actually Pepco is operating three brands. This is Pepco, Poundland and Deals. Uh, could you explain yeah. what are the, distinguish, the distinguishing features of these three brands and to, to what extent yeah. do they overlap? Do they, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the first thing to say is whilst there are three brands, there are only really two businesses because the Poundland and Deals business is the same business. But we made a, a, a simple but important decision that when we opened the Poundland business outside the UK, we'd call it something other than Poundland because obviously it'd be foolish to call it Poundland. Zloty, Zloty Land or something like that maybe may have been better, but we call it uh, the Poundland business deals. And so there are only two. And what's different? Uh, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of similarities. Both of the businesses attract a value-seeking family shopper and mum uh, looking for, for low, low price, great value items. Both businesses have got small stores and both businesses typically have community locations. What's very different is what their lead product categories are. Pepco majors on apparel and soft home uh, and deals Poundland majors on uh, fast-moving consumer goods uh, and hardlines general merchandise. So in, in Poland, as you may have seen in some malls, uh, uh, Deals and Pepco now sit pretty closely to each other and they do not cannibalize each other at all. So they're very complementary in that way. Oh, what are you thinking about, uh, because you're introducing Deals brand to Poland, uh, and I'm wondering, have you considered just adding the merchandise from Deals to Pepco stores? Yeah, well, it, it, it's something that we continue to think about and it's a possibility of the future. But one of the challenges is, is um, you know, finding property of the right size and smaller stores 
are substantially easier to find than bigger stores. So in some ways, growing both businesses alongside each other will be easier. But, but it's a very good question, one that we haven't ruled out at some point in the future. Uh, all right. Um, and Pe Pepco is operating in 16 European countries. Please, again, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is there any, any large European country which is missing on this list? Uh, well, there, there, there are uh, several that are missing, but I mean, first of all, it's important to say that the markets we're in still have a lots of opportunity for growth. So, I mean, the business, as we said, is very successful in Poland, in the whole of CEE, and even in Poland, where it's most mature, there's still lots of opportunities to grow. So our first ambition will be to grow continuously in Eastern Europe, Central Eastern Europe. I mean, we've recently opened in Italy and Spain, and both of those markets are showing early uh, signs that the business would do very well there. Those markets are huge. And so there's probably between those two markets, 2,500 shops we can open. So, I mean, certainly there are other markets we will look at and go to eventually, but we'll do it at the right time and the right pace. And, and I see the opportunity for Pepco to be successful in every single uh, European market at some point in the future. In including Germany? <laughs> I think so. I mean, look, at you know, I'm not declaring here and now that we're going to enter Germany in the next six months, but, you know, for sure, I don't see any reason why Pepco can't be successful in Germany. Um, you, you may have read that we've, um, we've been looking for property in Austria. Uh, at some point in the near future, we'll open stores in Austria, and that's a very good uh, market to test out whether a German-style consumer is interested because you probably know those markets are really quite similar. So, uh, but yeah, you know, I'm sure at some point we will open in Germany. No, I, I was just thinking that they, the, in, the Germany is the motherland of some of the most famous, famous discount brands. That's, that's why I asked the question about Germany. Uh, and it seems that the coronavirus crisis actually increased the demand uh, for discount, uh, discount goods, which is certainly positive for Pepco. But then again, it's, uh, it seems that it applies mainly to the uh, grocery type of, 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 uh, uh, of discount goods. What about uh, the, the, the discount source of the type of merchandise, merchandise that you offer? Yeah, I think long term will clearly be a beneficiary of a coronavirus because people's uh, family budgets will be you know, tough in the next few years, I think. Uh, and so even more people will be looking for discounts. So I'm, I'm very clear that we will do well. I mean, clearly what's different between grocery businesses and other businesses during coronavirus is a lot of our stores and a lot of stores like ours under government regulation were forced to close. Uh, and, and yet, because of the hard work of the great colleagues we have, as soon as the stores reopen, you know, the businesses rebound very successfully. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I take this opportunity to thank the amazing colleagues we have. The, the other thing to bear in mind is that, uh, you know, consumer shopping habits changed during coronavirus. Even where our shops were open, people were staying at home, not going out. And so there's a very big shift in what people bought. So our general merchandise business did very, very well. Uh, and, and quite naturally, our clothing business did less well because you know, people weren't buying a piece of outerwear because they just weren't going out so much. Uh, does, the, does the fact that your stores were uh, periodically closed during the coronavirus crisis, does it explain quite a substantial decrease in your profit, profits last year, despite Absolutely. an increase in revenues? Yeah, it's, right. it's totally to do with the disruption to the business, totally. I mean, uh, un underneath that headline, where shops were open for any period of time, they were as, as successful as they normally would be. So, as you say, the profit reduction is all about the disruption costs of, of coronavirus. Uh, another trend uh, which was uh, mm, uh, quite visible during the coronavirus crisis was that customers moved to shopping on the internet. Uh, and some experts say that this change will be for good. Uh, is Pepco thinking about uh, jumping on the bandwagon of uh, e-commerce? Well, look, it, clearly it's a very good question. And you're right to say a lot of shoppers shop more online. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the thing I think we need to think about is our particular shoppers and, and how they behave in the context of our business. So, look, the first thing to uh, put on the table is the fact that our 
average basket size, the amount that someone uh, buys in our shop is about eight euros. And they shop with us very conveniently on a weekly basis. So, and they're seeking very, very low prices. W with that in mind, I don't think it's in our customers' interest to be encouraging them to shop online where there's a, a roughly three euro delivery charge to home. So I, I, I don't think for a basket the size that we sell, uh, online is a huge threat to our business in the short or medium term. Um, but yeah, look, we are interested to understand if there is a business uh, for us online. And so we're doing some trials right now to see if, if, if there is a different sort of shopping occasion that people want to shop with us. You know, a much bigger basket will make the economics much more viable. So we're trialing things. But I really don't think our, our core shopper uh, will transfer her spend online anytime soon. This applies both to Pepco and the Deals brand? The logic behind not going to, you know? Absolutely. Well, interestingly, both businesses have got pretty much the same basket size, interestingly. So, you know, it's, it's a very similar business in that sense. Uh, over the last couple of months, many companies were complaining about the surging cost of commodities, including uh, timber and cotton, and shortages of some materials uh, and components, and also about surging costs of transport and freight. Uh, have these uh, disruptions? Uh, how have how has how have uh, these disruptions affected your your business? Yeah. Well, again, it's a good question, and, uh, and you're absolutely right, particularly around freight and commodity prices, timber, cotton, as you say, they've all seen some significant inflation. I mean, it's my best judgment that a lot of these inflationary pressures are short to medium term. If you look behind the headlines, then a lot of the reasons are to do with post-COVID changing dynamics of, of things, as an example. Freight, the, the, a lot of the freight liners were just mothballed during COVID. Uh, demand increased dramatically post COVID, so there's a short-term surge in in pricing. So, uh, the the actions we're taking are, are, are on the assumption that this is a six to twelve month impact, and on that basis, we are more than happy and able to absorb the extra costs into our P and L and not pass those charges on to customers. Uh, you know, all, all of the forecasts we've given to investors and to the market factor in those those uh, things you're talking about. But it is it is real. There are some very significant pressures. But as I say, I see them to be short to medium term rather than long term. Well, some economists worry, uh, or actually maybe some, some, some also cheer, uh, that the coronavirus crisis will mark the end of uh, the uh, era of very low inflation or that will somehow mark the beginning of inflation. Could this, do you see this uh, um, as potentially, potentially undermining the viability of this country dating? Uh, no, there was, I mean, look, no. first of all, I, I'm not an economist. I can't forecast whether inflation is going to happen or not. But look, it, it, you know, I've been in discount retailing for 30 years and, and therefore experienced periods of inflation. When you think about it, when prices are going up, even more, percentage of the population is going to be looked for lowest prices. So actually, inflation uh, favours discount retailers because there'll be even more value-seeking shoppers during that period of time. I certainly, by the way, don't uh, recommend that anyone likes inflation. I don't see it as a good thing, but if it happens, we'll probably benefit from it. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, and I'll just remind uh, our, uh, our audience, audience that our guest today was Andy Bond, who is the CEO of Pepco Group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.